Nasty fog again this morning. Can't hardly see across the street. Why six pints? Oh, she's so here. Found it on the doorstep. Oh, Mrs. Bridges must have left it last night when she came in. Don't know why. We've got plenty in the larder. It's that thick. There was this motor car in Belgrave Square crawling with a lad walking in front carrying <laughs> a lamp. <laughs> Proper pea <piece> super. <laughs> Mind how you go with Daisy. Oh, she'll be all right. She can see in the dark with her blinkers on. <laughs> Mr. Hudson, I couldn't take Mrs. Bridges her morning tea. Why not? I couldn't get into her room. Her door's locked. Did you knock? Twice, but she didn't answer. It seems that Mrs. Bridges has slept in this morning, Rose. Was her day out yesterday? I failed to see the connection. I'll take these to the larder. Are you sure her door was locked? Oh, yes, Mr. Hudson. I tried ever so hard to open it. Maybe she didn't come back. I didn't hear her come in last night. Neither did I. Do you think something could have happened to her? I mean, you never know in the fog. Maybe someone slit her throat down one of them dark alleys, like Jack the Ripper. Oh, not Mrs. Bridges, Doris. Jack the Ripper liked him a wee bit younger than that. More your age. Rose, you better go up and see. Maybe she's ill. Oh, yes, Mr. Hudson. Give me that cup of tea and you'll get on with the range. It's cold now. If she gets cold tea... Is that all right for oversleeping, lazy cat? No, Rose, that's enough of that. Mrs. Bridges, seven o'clock. Mrs. Bridges! I couldn't rouse her, but I could hear sounds coming from her room. Oh, better just leave her then and get on. We'll try again in half an hour. Well, I'd best get Doris to me with upstairs breakfast then. Yes, and take this down if you please, Rose. Yes, Mr. Hudson. Morning. Morning, my dear. You're up bright and early. There's rather a lot to do today. Anything startling in the paper? Nothing much. Well, Curzon's got his way. He's seeking election to sit in the Lords among the Irish peers. Without an acre of Irish land. At least his voice will be heard at Westminster once again after years in the wilderness. Never was a public servant so shamefully treated. When I think what that man did for India... You must tell him so next week when he dines here. Mm, I shall. I must be going soon. I'm seeing my tailor this morning. Hudson, please. Mm -hmm. It's time for me to face Mrs. Bridges again. Why do you say that? Well, she's been so moody lately. And you never can see eye to eye on the subject of desserts. She seems to have changed in the last few weeks. Perhaps she's had a secret offer from someone outside. Oh, you know, that is possible. Mrs. Van Groben raved about our dinner party the other night. She asked if we had a French chef from Paris. And what did you say? I said we had a very ordinary, rather temperamental widow from Bristol. She said she thought the dinner worthy of Rosa Lewis herself. Oh, praise indeed. You rang, my lady. Oh, yes, Hudson, send Mrs. Bridges up, would you? Uh, beg pardon, my lady, but I'm afraid it appears that Mrs. Bridges has slept in this morning. Uh, she hasn't been down for her breakfast yet. Not down yet, but it's nearly ten o'clock. Uh, quite, my lady. Somebody better go up to her room and rouse her. Oh, we've tried, sir. Rose has been up twice, but... What? She wasn't able to get in, sir. The door was locked. Why is her door locked? It was her day off yesterday, sir. Well, what's that got to do with it? Are you suggesting she came home intoxicated or something? Oh, no, sir. You're sure she's in her room? Oh, yes, my lady. There wasn't any answer, but Rose said she distinctly heard sounds coming from inside the room. I'll go and see to it at once, my lady. Sir. It really is too bad. One gives her every consideration and she behaves like this. I suppose that's the price one must pay for superb skill in the kitchen. Well, I particularly wanted her at her best next week. To impress the Italian ambassador? Sam Curzon. The crews are coming too. And F. E. Smith, he likes good food. Ah, Mrs. Bridges. Our ladyship is waiting for you, Mrs. Bridges. In the morning room. Oh, really, what is that woman doing? It's gone ten o'clock. Oh, my goodness. I must go. You lunching at your club? Yes, with old George Chesterfield. I'll see you this evening. 
Mrs. Bridges. There you are. You'd uh, better go in. Yes, come in, Mrs. Bridges. I've been waiting for you. Did you have a pleasant day off yesterday? Yes, my lady. I understand from Hudson that you've had no breakfast. Not hungry, my lady. It's no business of Hudson's. I beg your pardon? I said it's nothing to do with Hudson what time I come down of a morning. I'm afraid I don't agree with you. Hudson is responsible for the smooth running of this house. And I'm responsible for the meals, my lady. I know you are, Mrs. Bridges, and I expect you to be punctual for meals in the servants' hall and to set a good example to the others. I also expect you to observe my rules, one of which is that I will not have the servants in this house locking their bedroom doors. I thought I'd made that quite clear. Why was your door locked this morning when Rose tried to rouse you? Well? I have a right to my privacy, my lady, without the under-servants poking and prying into my affairs. Everyone's against me. All talking and whispering behind my back. Seeing as that was my fault, Emily done herself in. Come I know us. what they're saying. They're all against me. I know I'm not wanted in this house, nor appreciated neither. So I must give him the notice and clear out, and that's all I have to say, thanking you, my lady. Mrs. Bridges, come back here at once. I'm giving him Notice, my lady. No, Mrs. Bridges, you're doing nothing of the kind. Now, calm yourself and sit down. Come along now, sit down. Hey, good. Hey. Now then, what's the matter with you these days? Aren't you going to tell me? I can't. You haven't been yourself for some weeks, have you? No, my lady. Are you unwell? I get these headaches. Sharp pains through me head, my lady. Everything seems to be on top of me and I can't stop crying. I lie awake thinking about that poor dead girl. If I scolded her sometimes, it was only to make her a better kitchen maid and to get on in service. I trained under a strict cook myself, my lady at Southwold. You've got to be firm with them. And then, when Emily killed herself, it was, it was like as if I lost my hope, Doctor. She was like that. <laughs> Mrs. Bridges, would it surprise you to know that I too lie awake at night thinking about Emily? It was a terrible shock to all of us, but we must try and get over it. I miss her in my kitchen. I miss that girl. It was a good girl. Oh, now dry your tears and try not to think about it anymore. Yes, my lady. You've been here such a long time and I like to think that we're old friends. If these headaches continue, I'll have you examined by Dr. Foley. Thank you, my lady. It's just that sometimes I feel... What? Lonely, my lady. You see, since Bridges was took 15 years ago now, come April, I've had no one. I mean, no one what belongs to me. I've got my friend in Victoria, but... It's not the same. It's not like someone as belongs to you, is it, my lady? Mrs. Bridges, perhaps we should discuss the meals now, if you're quite ready. Very good, my lady. Mrs. Bridges? Are you there, Mrs. Bridges? I've got to come in and sweep. Mrs. Bridges! I think something quite simple. Some fish, perhaps? Yes, my lady. Would you Mr. like Mr. Hudson? What is it, Alice? I thought I ought to tell you. What girl? Oh, 
it's a funny sound coming from Mrs. Bridges' room. Oh, there can be. But there is, Mr. Hudson. Mrs. Bridges happens to be in the morning room with her ladyship. But I heard it. Thump, thump against the wall. Oh, you're imagining things, girl. I'm not, Mr. Hudson, honest. Well, why didn't you go in and see what it was? Well, the door was locked, Mr. Hudson. Not again. Could there be thieves in the house? I have no idea, Alice. You'd better come with me. Wait here and I'll get the master key from my pantry. Listen. I'm Mrs. Bridges. That's daft. She Why wouldn't do anything like that. Door lock? Yeah, come up with me, Alice. Yes, Mr. Hudson. Oh, and Doris. Yes, Mr. If Mrs. Bridges comes back down here while we're upstairs, don't say anything about this. Do you understand? Yes, Mr. Hudson. Come on, Alice. <laughs> There was a noise, Mr. Hudson. I swear there was. Listen. There it is. Can't you hear it, Mr. Hudson? Ah, there is someone in there right now. Just you stand clear, Alice. Is there any danger? You can never be sure. Just keep well out of the way. I'll unlock the door. Right now! Very good, lady. Thinking nuts. Get out of there. Go, get out. Think. Doris, how are you, Doris? Emily, come and give oh Mrs. Bridges a hand, a hand, someone. I can't manage by myself. Where's it come from, then? That's what I'd like to know. Some relative, I expect. Ask Mrs. Bridges to mind it for her or while she's in the shop. Well, why'd she lock the door? Then nobody would harm it, would they? She could have brought it down here. We'd have given it some milk. You're quite right. That's because it's not been honestly come by. She's stolen that baby. What's going to happen to her? Will she be arrested? Well, Mr Hudson's speaking to her ladyship now, so we'll soon know. I'd best be getting back to the kitchen. She'll be needing me now. Lay out the saucepans then, shall I, Mrs Bridges? Down will fall, baby, cradle. <laughs> Thank you, Hudson. I came as quickly as I decently could. We were in the middle of lunch when the message came. What's happened? Uh, Mrs. Bridges isn't well, Richard. She's in rather serious trouble. Trouble? Last night, in the fog, on the way back from her day off, she took a baby from its perambulator outside a shop. Took a baby? Stole it from its parents. I've been visiting my friend, sir, Mrs Gray. She used to be cook to Lady Wallenford. 
style now, sir. I've come across this pram outside a greengrocer's. Nobody minding it. Such a lovely baby laying there, smiling at me. I stopped to see so and I touched its little hand. Well, I couldn't help but touch it. And when its tiny fingers curled round mine, I, I felt as if I had to pick it up, sir. Well, no harm after all, sir. I mean, there was nobody there. I knew it was wrong, sir, but I just couldn't help it. I only wanted to hold it to me, just for a minute, sir. But you see, it was cold and foggy, and so I took a shawl off of the pram and I wrapped the little mite up in it. Still nobody come out of the shop. And then I... You what? Started to walk with it, sir, in my arms, round the corner. Down the street. Which street? Oh, where was this? She doesn't remember, Richard. And where's the child now? <coughs> Being cared for, sir, in the servants' hall. Oh, my God. <laughs> and nobody tried to stop you? No, no, nobody saw you take it? It was thick fog, sir. You could hardly see your hand in front of your face. What on earth made you do a thing like that? Have you thought of the parents of the child? What they must be going through at this very moment? The terrible anxiety? <laughs> Richard, please. Well, I'm sorry, but whether Mrs. Bridges acted on some sudden impulse or not, the fact remains that some wretched mother is searching all over London for a, a stolen baby, and that baby happens to be here in this house. I'm sorry, Lady, I couldn't help it. Just come out of me. Mrs. Bridges, are you, are you sure you can't remember which street you were in? Have you any idea of the shop? A, a greengrocer, you said. Yes, it was a greengrocer. I know that, but I, I don't know what street it was. Somewhere in Victoria, near my friend. Somewhere in Pimlico. She better go up to her room for the time being. <laughs> if she'll remember after she's calmed down. Go with her, Hudson, and then come back here. You're very good, my I'm lady. sorry, my lady. Come along, then, Mrs. Bridges. I'll see you upstairs to your room. Oh. You better have a wee lie down oh, for a bit. Of course, the police have got to be informed. Richard, no. How else are we to trace the parents? I can't allow Mrs. Bridges to be carted off by the police. It would kill her. Besides, I have an important dinner party to give next week. How can you think about dinner parties at a time like this? Because I have to, Richard. I have to run this house and entertain important people for your sake. How can I do that without my cook? I can't find a new cook at a minute's notice. Marjorie, I am trying to be very, very patient with you. A child has been stolen from its pram by Mrs. Bridges. The parents have got to be found at once and the child returned. That's all that matters. Yes, but if we could find out where it came from, we could send it back. Oh. Well, with some sort of explanation. Marjorie, have you quite lost your reason? You are trying to... You are asking me to bypass the normal course of the law to shield a person who is guilty of a criminal offence. Mrs. Bridges is not a criminal, Richard. She's ill. She's been through a lot lately and she needs rest and care. No doubt. And it's our responsibility to look after our servants when they get into trouble. There's trouble and trouble and this is a, a bad case of child theft and the police have got to be told whether you like it or not. And that's what we have to do, my dear. Will there be any further instructions, sir? No, Hudson. Thank you, sir. Hudson! I have an idea. Am I right in thinking that you have a friend in the police force? Yes, my lady, Sergeant Mackay, around Gerald Road. I thought you had. I think you ought to be very careful, Marjorie. I shall be. Hudson, how would it be if you were to bump into Sergeant Mackay somewhere around by Gerald Road Police Station? I understand perfectly, my lady. Do you, Hudson? Indeed, sir. I understand the need to trace the parents of the wee baby and return their property to them immediately without involving the police. Put it that way, sir. And you think you can? If luck is on my side, sir. And provided, of course, that her ladyship or yourself will not be requiring me for the rest of the afternoon. Oh, that's understood. Now, all we need is the address of the people in the strictest confidence, of course. You can rely on me, sir, my lady. Oh, and Hudson. Sir, not a word to the other servants for the time being. Oh, naturally, sir. Oh. Rose? 
Rose, where are you, Rose? Ah, Rose. Shh. The baby's asleep. Oh, we'd only just got him off, Mr. Hudson. The old devil is that wakeful. I am going out, Rose, on a very important errand for the master. Yes, Mr. Hudson. When Edward gets back from his afternoon off, inform him that he may have to deputise for me at dinner in case I'm not back in time. Just to see if the fire's all right, my lady. Oh, yes, perhaps another piece of coal, Rose. It's turned much colder. Yes, my lady. But the fog's not quite so thick. That's good. Hudson's still not back. Uh, not yet, my lady. Oh, if that's Mr. Bellamy, tell him I'm in here, will you? Yes, my lady. A ladyship from the morning room, sir. Any news? No, sir. I gather Hudson's not back yet. No. Nope. Run over three hours. What can have happened to him? Well, his friend in the police may not have been there. He may have had to wait for him. To come on duty. Oh. Most possibly. The evening paper, sir. Thank you, Rose. Is there anything there uh, about a stolen child? Well, not that I can see. Will there be anything else, my lady? Uh, yes, Rose. What time can we dine? Oh, any time you wish, my lady. It's all ready. Uh, will I tell Edward to ring the gong? Yes, in ten minutes we won't change. Very good, my lady. I just hope it tastes of something. I'm sure it will, Rose. They're being absolutely splendid, Richard. What's that, my dear? The servants. I'm saying they're being simply marvellous. Rose and Doris have cooked the dinner, and Alice is busy looking after the baby. That's very commendable, Rose. We're very grateful. Oh, I'm sure we don't mind doing a bit extra, sir, if it's to help Mrs Bridges. Oh. Will that be all, my lady? Yes, thank you, Rose. You know, they really are the most extraordinary people. I mean, that woman causes so many upsets downstairs with her moods and tantrums, yet they're all ready to cover up for her. Domestic servants are more loyal by nature than politicians. Ah, hmm. oh, Hudson. My oh. lady, we're worried about you. I trust you'll pardon me for coming straight in as I am, sir, but... Oh, you're soaking wet. Well, I'm very sorry, sir. It began to sleet a wee bit when I reached Eaton Square. Well, uh, what news? I am able to report, sir, my lady, that I have ascertained the identity of the baby's parents. Well done, man. And where they live? Yes, sir. It seems that a, a baby was reported stolen from its perambulator outside the premises of Messrs. Walsh and Sons, the fruiterers in Looper Street, my lady, between the hours of 5.30 and 6 p.m. last evening. And the parents? Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Arthur Weber, sir, of 96A Vauxhall Bridge Road. I also memorised the address, sir. I wonder what sort of people? Oh, middle class, my lady, but quite respectable, I understand. We must order the motor at once. I still don't like this, Marjorie. I think we ought to inform the police you, first. You agreed. Oh, very well. Tell Pierce to bring the motor around at once. Very good, sir. Yes, Hudson, and ask Rose to have the child well wrapped up, ready for travel, and brought up to the hall. Dinner will have to wait till we get back. Very good, my lady. How much will you offer these people as compensation? We shall have to wait and see what their circumstances are. But he's quite unarmed. Don't distress yourself. May we come in? <laughs> We're not very tidy. <laughs> Is your husband at home, Mrs. Weber? It's a medical yes. outside, Lily. Is that Johnny back? He's been found, has he? These people this, found him, this did lady they? and gentleman, Arthur. They brought him back just a few minutes ago. Oh, Arthur, he's safe. He's all right. Well, we're very grateful, I'm sure. Where was the child found? Oh, let me introduce myself and explain. It's my card. Oh, I see. Uh, Mr. Webber, I must hasten to assure you, neither my wife nor I were responsible for taking your child from its pram last evening. The fact is that we regretted very much a certain member of my domestic staff had 
an unfortunate lapse, a quite irrational longing to possess the child. She regrets the action very much. What was her name, the woman who stole our kitty? Uh, well, I hardly think that's relevant, Mr. Weber. Hey? Of course, there's the question of compensation. We realize that you and your wife have suffered a great deal of anxiety. Yes, we both think you're entitled to some form of restitution. I'm asking you a simple question, Mr. Bellamy. I would have thought... Who stole our baby? I would have thought it best for you to accept a modest sum as a token of our apologies for... For what one of your maids has done, is that it? Mr. Weber, the woman in question happens to be our cook. Now, are you willing to accept our apologies for what has happened, tell the police the child has been found, and leave it at that? I think it would be well advised to do so, and so save a lot of unnecessary fuss. Oh, you do, do you? Arthur. No, Lily. If people like them think they can buy their way out of having their underpaid and overworked domestic servants had up in court, they're very much mistaken. Who said anything about court? The woman who stole our infant, Mr. Bellamy, is either a criminal or a lunatic. In either case, she ought to be behind bars where she can't snatch any more infants from their prams. As for your offer of compensation, sir, I see from your card you're a Member of Parliament. You should know better than to try and impede the law by offering a man a bribe. I see no point in continuing this conversation. Come along, Margaret. What are you going to do? Wait and see. Oh, don't do anything foolish, Arthur. We've got Johnny back. Don't cause any more trouble. Not with the likes of them. They always come out on top in the end, and you know it. People like that. I know they do, Lily. That's just my point. So when Miss Roberts told her ladyship she couldn't get the stain out of her grey coat, she had her head snapped off. Let's keep out of her way, then. What I can't understand is why Mrs Bridges didn't get pushed. I mean, causing all that trouble. I can't afford to lose her, that's why. She's too good a cook. Besides, they took the baby back to its owners and there's an end to it. It was a lark, having a baby to take care of, even if it was only for a few hours. Hey, Rose? It was all right. <sighs> Dear little thing, I'd love to have a baby. Oh, I dare say your turn will come one day. And it does, let's hope it's intentional. On the front door. This early? we better get out of here in case it's visitors. Mr Hudson, we're down in the morning room. Very good, Rose. Well, hurry up and get downstairs. There's someone at the front door. Oh, come on now. Quickly, girl, quickly. Is this Mr Richard Bellamy's residence? It is. I understand there's a cook employed on these premises. And that is so. The back door is down the steps there. Uh, just one moment, if you please. I am a police officer, Detective Inspector Cape. I should like a word with your master. In what connection, if you don't mind my asking? A report received concerning an incident that took place last evening. Now, kindly fetch your master. You better come in. Oh, I'll go and inform Mr Bellamy. His permission will be required before Mrs Bridges can interrupt her duties in the kitchen. Wait here, please. Excuse me, sir. There's a gentleman from the police, Detective Inspector Cape. He wants to see Mrs. Bridges. Well, show me now, will you? Well, I understood, sir, since the baby was returned last night. Oh, no, Hudson. The matter's far from close. I rather expected this. Should I fetch Mrs. Bridges? Well, sir? not yet. Just leave this to me. I've heard about this, Inspector Cape, sir, from my friend Sergeant Mackay at the station. I understand he's a holy terror. Yes, but well, he's not going to terrorize me. You show him in. Very good, sir. Detective Inspector Cape, sir. Come in now, will you, Inspector? I'll try not to keep you waiting, sir. I understand you have your parliamentary duties to fulfil. I can spare you 20 minutes or so. That will suffice. Should be sufficient, sir. Well, do sit down. No, thank you, sir. Now, sir. Uh, Mr Arthur Weber of 96A Vauxhall Bridge Road reported to Gerald Road Police Station at 6.30 on Wednesday evening that his wife had returned from the shops in a state of some distress to say that their baby was missing from its perambulator. The discovery was made when she came out of a greengrocer's shop in Lupus Street. Particulars were taken, and a call sent out duly to all constables on the beat to keep a watch out for the missing child. Yes, I know all about this. I have not quite finished, sir, if you don't mind. Very well. Go on. This gentleman has since reported to the police that his infant was returned to his address unharmed at 7.45 last evening by yourself and your wife. Is that correct, sir? Yes, that's quite correct. 
Uh, but I thought they were to finish the matter. I tried to explain to this man, Weber, that... If a child was stolen by a woman in your employ, as Mr. Weber claims, sir, then I shall have no alternative but to charge her with kidnapping. Now, look, Inspector, is this absolutely necessary? I'm afraid it is, sir. On the evidence before me, it's my duty to charge her under the Offence Against Young Persons Act of 1861. Do you mean to say you're, you're going to arrest my cook in this house and take her off to the police station? Yes, sir. Oh, I should be glad if you'd call her if she's on the premises. Of course she's on the premises. She's in the kitchen cooking our lunch. Then you'll have to do without your lunch, won't you, sir? And you can keep your impotent comments to yourself. You best inform the mistress of the house, sir, had you not? Yes, I certainly will. How long do you expect to keep Mrs. Bridges in custody? She'll be charged now, sir, and detained overnight and appear in court in the morning. You're perfectly within your rights, of course, and you must do your duty. I'm only sorry this man Weber felt it necessary to make an issue of the incident. You rang, sir? Yes, Hudson. Will you ask her ladyship to come down? I think she's upstairs in her room. Very good, sir. And, uh, Hudson, will you warn Bridges to stop whatever she's doing and get a hat and coat on? The police want to ask her some questions at the station. I understand, sir. With your permission, sir, I'll keep this news from the staff for the time being. If you can, Hudson. Thank you, sir. My wife will be down shortly. There is one more question, sir. Well? How did you know where to return the infant? I note you failed to report your discovery to the police. I don't like your tone, Inspector. Don't you, sir? I must remind you that the failure to report the discovery of a felony may be taken as acting as an accessory after the fact. I am aware of the law. You're talking to a former Minister of the Crown. And I am carrying out my duties as an officer of the law, sir. In view of your position, I shall, of course, overlook the matter on this occasion. But I must warn you in future not to go about offering money. Mr. Weber knows perfectly well that money was offered to him and his wife as a gesture of compensation. They didn't take it, did they, sir? That is their business. Richard, what's all this about Mrs. Bridges being arrested? It's quite outrageous. Oh, Marjorie, you... this is Inspector Cape of the local police, my wife. Good morning. Well? The inspector is acting quite correctly, Marjorie, according to the law. I suggest we offer him a glass of sherry until Mrs. Bridges is quite ready. You don't take on Mrs. Bridges. I'm sure your friend will be all right. Yeah. I just make it my own. It's because she's old and got no one. The police come to fetch you. She'll have given them your address, see? Yeah. Not like Ivy to be took sick. She's always had good health. It's this friend of hers, you understand, Doris, down near Victoria. She's been taken to the hospital and, well, uh, she's asked to see Mrs. Bridges. Alice says there's a detective in the hall. Oh, yes. Yes, well, as I explained to Alice and the others, the, uh, the police have come to take Mrs. Bridges to her friend's bedside. Oh, I see. Now, get on with your work, Doris. There's a good girl. Yes, Mr. Hudson. Ah, Mrs. Bridges. I'll tell them you're ready. <laughs> Mrs. Bridges is ready, sir, in the hall. Oh, uh, thank you, Hudson. Sir. That'll do, Rose. Mrs. Bridges, will you go with the inspector and try not to worry? Very good, sir. Will it be all right, sir? I mean, to go by the... The front door? Well, of course. <laughs> that poor, wretched woman. She looked as though she was going to the gallows. Well, you must telephone to Harry Compton at once. What on earth for? Good heavens, Richard, if the Lord Chief Justice can't get this ridiculous case stopped, nobody can. Now, listen to me, Marjorie. I've already tried to bypass the law once to save your cook from going to prison. There must be something we can do, and she's your cook, too. Well, there's precious little we can do. 
I should go to the magistrate's court tomorrow. I'm ready to give evidence of a good character. That's something, I suppose. I shall also call on Jeff Dillon this afternoon and ask him to send one of his juniors into court tomorrow. If he's got any sense, he'll plead guilty and ask for a remand on bail. A remand for what? Well, I hope the magistrate's progressive enough to remand her for a doctor's report. Yes, but supposing the doctor says she's not fit enough to go on working? Well, I'm sure Dr. Foley will be very sensible about that. Oh, well, if it's Dr. Foley... Well, naturally, I sort of suggest having her examined by my own doctor. There again, they might not permit it. But if they do, we'll have nothing more to worry about. If it happens that way, no. But it's a big if. Can't always be sure of the magistrate. Some of them think like this man Weber. If this one does, he'll refuse to listen to any excuses and clap her in jail. Yes, I suppose so. And then where will we be? Sorry, old chap. But it's not in my power to stop this case. Not now. You could refuse to give evidence for the prosecution. Then there would be no case to answer. Why should I, eh? For one thing, to save the heavy costs of court proceedings, Mr. Weber, which fall, as you should know, on the overburdened taxpayer. <laughs> you ought to be in Parliament yourself, old chap. Why don't you swap places with his nibs, eh? Because I know better than to seek a higher station in life than the one into which I was born. <sighs> I am proud and honoured to serve a noble and distinguished family, and I know my place. Well, I wouldn't stand for it. Running up and down stairs, bowing and scraping and answering bells like a monkey on a stick. We all serve a master, Mr. Webber, unless we happen to be King Edward himself, which we are not. I have no doubt there's someone at your place of work superior to you whom you must address as sir and treat with respect due to his rank in the firm. I've got an employer, yes. Old Strick, as we call him. Mr. Strickland, our chief clerk. And you call him Strickers to his face, do you? No, not exactly. Well, there you are, then. And you respect him, this man Strickland, whom you must address as sir? Respect him? He's the biggest fool in the department. We all laugh at him. So, you work for a fool. I work for a man of charm and character, Mr. Weber. He's a member of Parliament and married into one of the great ruling families of the land with 400 years of political influence behind them. And you ask me if I am content with my position in life. All right. I'll be a butler then to some duke. Think you can get me a position? You'd have to acquire a very different attitude towards domestic service, I fear, before any self-respecting family would allow you to announce their guests or wait at their table. You can't take a joke, can you? Some things are not a subject for jests, Mr. Weber. So I cannot persuade you to withhold your evidence tomorrow and avoid a great deal of unpleasantness. As I said, Mr. Hudson, it's out of my hands now. The law must take its course. Then I'll not impose on you any further. Good night. Is Hudson's mother ill again? Why do you ask that? I was wondering why he asked for time off this evening. It's the only time he ever does. He didn't give a reason. Oh, yes, Hudson, pardon, is it? Sir, my lady. Might I speak to you for a moment, sir? Yes, you may. I would very much like to visit the police court tomorrow morning, sir, if you will permit it. You, Hudson? Yes, my lady. You'll find it very distressing, Hudson, sitting there watching Mrs. Bridges in the dock. It's... I am acquainted to a certain extent with the process of the law, sir, after a number of visits to the public gallery at the Old Bailey. How gruesome of you, Hudson. Not at all, my lady. I often go to the Central Criminal Court in my days off to hear the great advocates plead. Uh, just as one would visit Lord's Cricket Ground, sir, to watch Ranjit Singe or Dr. Grace at the Wicket. I do not go to gaze with morbid curiosity in the faces of the murderers, my lady. I see. Well, there's no reason why you shouldn't go, as long as the household functions properly during your absence. I would naturally ensure that it does, sir. But Hudson, don't you think it might upset Mrs. Bridges if she caught sight of you on the public benches? I have in mind taking a small part in the proceedings, my lady, if it can be arranged. Taking part? If I could be called to the witness box, sir, I think I could make a useful contribution to the hearing. Uh, you mean as a witness to her character? Something of the kind, sir. I would have to see the solicitor acting for Mrs. Bridges, if she were to have such a privilege. Mm -hmm. uh, furthermore, I would need to make arrangements for the clerk of the court to see Mrs. Bridges before the hearing. But we, as a matter of fact, I call on Sir Jeff Dillon this afternoon. Uh, someone from that office will be attending tomorrow. You could speak to him, whoever he is, as soon as he gets into court. But just tell him who you are. Thank you very much, sir, my lady. What an extraordinary request. I hope he won't say something rash and make matters worse. Oh, I think we can rely on Hudson, my dear. He's nobody's fool. 
And you thought, no doubt, that in a thick fog, nobody would see you take the infant from its perambulator? I never thought about it either way, sir, about getting caught. I took the baby because I felt old. As if I wanted to hold it in my arms, sir, and love the little mite. I never stopped to think about it being some other woman's baby. I, I just had to have it in my arms, sir, and keep it warm. Safe. You had no idea whatsoever of the identity of the owner or her address? No, sir. Well, there was no question of any intention of returning the infant. Your aim was to steal and keep the property. Oh, I wanted to take it back after, sir, but it was too late. If I may intervene here, Your Worship. Yes? I ought to make it quite clear that the plea of not guilty to theft is based on a momentary loss of responsibility on my client's part. Uh, this has been due to certain recent stresses at her place of employment and a psychological condition of the accused woman's mind, a temporary one, in respect of which I am asking to bring further evidence. Very well. Uh, call Mr Angus Hudson, please. <laughs> Do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give before this court is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall help you, God? I do. Uh, you are Angus Hudson, employed as butler at the premises in Eaton Place, where, as we have heard, the accused is employed as cook. I am, sir. How long have you known the accused? Well, approximately 12 years, sir. I still can't understand why Mr. Hudson told her she was going to visit her friend in hospital. To spare Mrs. Bridges' feelings, I expect. Not very nice for Cook to be arrested by the police in front of all the other servants. She won't come back if she goes to prison. No, she won't. Is it true Mr. Hudson's gone to watch? I suppose so. I'm surprised at Mr. Hudson. It's morbid. It's like going to a public hanging. Why? People go to funerals. That's not morbid. It's showing respect. Isn't it? So from what you have observed of the moods and general behaviour of the accused below stairs during the last few weeks, would you say she was suffering from severe nervous strain? Most definitely, sir. And what do you think was the cause of this? She was particularly upset by the recent suicide in the house of a young kitchen maid who worked under her. Being a very lonely person with no relatives or dependents, she'd come to regard the dead girl as like a daughter. They were very close. And you agree with the evidence of Dr. Foley as to her nervous condition? I do, sir. And I would like to add that I believe Mrs. Bridges is badly in need of love and affection and a sense of being wanted. She is a brilliant cook, Your Worship, and was highly regarded in that capacity by my employers. But in the personal sense, she has no one to care for, except for an elderly woman friend of some years standing. And nobody to care for her or advise her or look after her. It is for that reason that I have offered her marriage. We are both unattached persons, Your Worship, and it occurred to me that I could undertake to keep the accused lady happy and cared for in the future during our continued service with Lady Marjorie Bellamy, and in later years when we will have perhaps retired. Your Worship might see his way to overlook this unfortunate lapse. And be assured, sir, that with me to help and guide her, such a thing would never occur again. And furthermore, sir... Uh, yes, yes, thank you, Mr. Hudson. You may stand down now. Thank you. Sir, your worship. Uh, your worship, in view of what you have heard, I'm asking you to dismiss this case. It seems to me, Bridges, that a large number of people have gone to a great deal of trouble to obtain your acquittal on this charge. Taking everything into consideration, I am prepared to accept the theft of Mrs. Weber's child as due to a momentary lapse of responsibility brought on by severe mental strain and depression. You have a good position in service, a thoughtful employer, and a most loyal colleague in the butler, Mr. Uh, Hudson. So I'm going to bind you over for three months on good behavior and hope that you will not have occasion to appear before me again. Thank you, sir. 
I've never heard anything like it outside the House of Commons or the High Courts of Justice. Marshall Hall himself could not have done better. But he can't really mean he wants to marry Mrs. Bridget. That's what he said in court, and he's asked her. But I gather she wants to wait. But at least the gesture helped get her off. <laughs> Begging your pardon, my lady. Hudson, what's all this I hear? Making a speech in court and offering to marry Mrs. Bridges? I must apologize to my lady and to the master for not asking your permission before offering my hand to Mrs. Bridges' marriage. The truth is that the idea only occurred to me last night in my pantry while I was pondering ways of helping Mrs. Bridges out of her troubles. But has she accepted you? That's the point. We discussed the matter in her cell at the police station, my lady, shortly before the hearing. And what did she say? Oh, she was very touched, my lady. Uh, she agreed that we should both, uh, being unattached, as it were, reserve ourselves for each other in the not-too-distant future, whilst continuing, meanwhile, in your ladyship's service as before. Well, that seems a very satisfactory arrangement. Where is Mrs. Bridges now? Waiting outside in the hall, my lady. She, she would very much like to come in and say something to you, if you wouldn't mind. Yes, of course, Hudson. Send her in. Thank you, my lady. Oh, but let it yeah, be. there, Mrs. Bridges. All over now. I'm so ashamed, my lady. Can you ever forgive me? I told you it's all over. The matter shall never be referred to in this house again. <laughs> You've all been so good to me. Well, Mr. Bellamy and I have done nothing except to turn the child to its parents. It's Hudson you have to thank. <laughs> yes, my lady. <laughs> Congratulations, Mrs. Bridges, on your exciting plans. <laughs> Hudson, you must open a bottle of my Krug 98 in the servants' hall and celebrate. Oh, thank you, sir. That's very good of you. All I want to do now, my lady, is to get back into my kitchen and get on with my well, job. Of course you do, Mrs. Oh. Bridges. Don't forget we've this important dinner party next Thursday. We'll discuss the menu in the morning. I want yes. you to give us a really special dinner. Oh, excuse me, my lady, if I may intervene on this point. You're not in court now, Hudson. Oh, no, sir. I... It was just to say that... Mrs. Bridges has been through a good deal of anxiety and distress lately, my lady. I was therefore planning for her to spend a few days with a sister of mine in Folkestone, if you would consider giving her some time off. Also, I've heard of an excellent cook who would be only too pleased to come in for the dinner party on Thursday evening. You never said none of this to me, Mr. Hudson. The idea was to surprise you with a wee holiday, Mrs. Bridges. I'm Once... not going on no wee holiday. Begging your pardon, my lady. Do you think I'm going off to Folkestone? Leave my kitchen to some outside cook when we've got important people to dinner. Well, I'm very grateful for the thought, Mr. Hudson. Well, you're not a husband yet, are you, Hudson? So it would seem, sir. No, he's not. Well, if you really feel you can manage Thursday, I'll be up in the morning, my lady, with some ideas for a main course. And this time, I won't be late. Very well, Mrs. <coughs> Bridges. Excuse me. Ron Hudson. Yes, sir. We're most grateful. It was a pleasure, sir. My lady. You know, when he was a young footman at Southwold, my mother always said he'd get on. The Scots always do. Well, I suppose luncheon will be a little late today. Can't be helped. <laughs> 